بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Today we're going to talk about الاستشراق Orientalism And Orientalism I feel like has to be talked about when you teach or, or learn any class that has to do with Islamic history because Orientalists obviously have something to say about Islamic history and oftentimes some of the things they say can be uh, crazy, borderline irrational, or simply complete lies. That's just the reality that we are dealing with. Um, and they have that ability because they're backed up by money and institutions of power. And I feel like if you want to be a, a student of knowledge, a sheikh, an imam, or what have you, that you are inevitably going to have to deal with the ideas of Orientalism. Because let's face it, that's what's being taught to our kids in their history classes in primary school, uh, high school, all that, as well as college and university. These ideas they will run into and they may confuse them, they may give them problems, and you would have to be the one to help them with that. So it's crucial, I think, for frankly, all Muslims across the globe to understand what Orientalism is and how to refute it, how to show its own stupidity. And this is uh, part of the reason why I did I do like traditional studies, madrasa studies. I went to the Islamic University of Minnesota, and I'm also going through the like American University system to do my PhD. And this was the way of Taha Hussein, and has been the tradition of Al Azhar since uh, the French invasion of Egypt with Napoleon. Many, many people at Azhar will get their bachelor's or maybe their master's at Azhar and then go and get their PhD from a Western university. I have many colleagues that I went to graduate school with at the University of Chicago who came from that background. I mean, countless that are in American universities right now that are Azhari uh, graduates and are doing their master's or PhD at a Western university. Um, this is the future. Moreover, if you want to ever do um, inner faith type of work, um, or you want to be an imam over a masjid someday, the standard in America for religious leaders, no matter what religion or denomination you are, is that you get a master's degree in divinity. And that basically means religious studies uh, with a combination of religious studies and historical studies. Um, and it's kind of a prerequisite in order to be recognized by the broader community in America, let's face it. And oftentimes, imams are discriminated against for their lack of English and their lack of this type of education that would bring a closer type of, uh, I guess you will say, mutual understanding between different uh, religions. Because if you don't have the same sort of training and discourse, it's harder to communicate with uh, rabbis and uh, priests, pastors, preachers, and all those types of things. So I feel like understanding Orientalism is important to any uh, student of knowledge nowadays for, for a plethora of reasons. And this is the 11th lecture in our series. Um, and, and this is more or less meant to um, give you tools necessary to analyze everything that we've read. You may be asking, Hamza, why did you assign us you know, Wilfred Madelung or Fred Donner or Hugh Kennedy or these different Orientalists. 
why are you not just having a surid tabari uh, or you know suyuti or these different things and we will get to that so here are the four figures we're going to talk about today ahlan wa sahlan assalamu alaykum ya tullab al and hiding up here in the corner is Jonathan Brown who's probably I would guess the most recognizable to you all just because of his uh, YouTube presence he's a Muslim convert and a professor at Georgetown University uh, fun fact he got his PhD from the University of Chicago where I went so me and him have had a lot of the same professors we both had Fred Donner as a professor for instance this over here is the very extremely famous Edward Said, Edward Wadi' Said, who was a professor at Columbia University, and uh, hiding behind here is Michel Foucault, the famous French postmodernist thinker. And over here is Wa'il Halak, who is a professor at Columbia University and specializes in the history of Islamic law as well as um, critiquing modernity, if you will, which we will get into here. So first we're going to talk about Edward Wadir Saeed, who died in 2003. And I assigned you a portion of his book, Orientalism, Western Conceptions of the Orient. And this book had a major impact on the Western Academy, mainly because the whole entire field of Orientalism was sharply criticized. And they felt this blow. Some of them just considered him a polemicist and did not take him seriously, but the majority of academics took him quite seriously and he basically pointed out the racism that exists in academia so there's a common misconception that studies have disproven that education is the cure to racism this is simply not true there are educated people professors phd holders who have been some of the most racist people on earth one example would be Goebbels the propaganda master of the Nazi regime so sorry hate to break it to you but there are a lot of educated folks out there who are racist either consciously or unconsciously and frankly people can use even their advanced knowledge to perpetuate racism. And so Edward Said attacks racism and Islamophobia in academia. He was born in 1935 in Palestine, but he was raised in Egypt. He did his bachelor's at Princeton University in 1957 a master's at Harvard University in 1960, as well as a PhD there in 1964. All of his degrees were in English literature. And that's what he was originally interested in. In 1963, right before he finished his PhD, he got a position teaching at Columbia University. So like myself, I'm a PhD student, but many of us uh, have to start teaching before we finish our PhD. And so he uh, started teaching at Columbia in the English and Comparative Literature Department, which he stayed at until his death in 2003. Originally, he did research in that field of English literature, but he was disturbed by the racism and Islamophobia he witnessed as an Arab in academia. If you're a person of color, in academia it's it's difficult even me I'm a white convert to Islam but just the fact that I'm a Muslim uh, you face a lot of discrimination in academia and then I come from poor 
lower class, very poor upbringing, that also makes me marginalized in academia because academia is predominantly rich white Protestants. And uh, I was very male dominated till recently. Um, it's more equal as far as uh, presence of the genders go, but there's still pay gaps and things like that and still problems in academia, a lot of systemic problems. And so Edward Said, he used his tools that he learned from doing a PhD in English literature of cultural critique and literary criticism against the racist colonizing field of Orientalism to gut its epistemological underpinnings. And remember, epistemology is thinking about how you think. Epistemology uh, you know, is answering questions like, what is truth? What is evidence? What type of reasoning do I use that is all related to epistemology or your theory of knowledge? And so he wanted to criticize the way that Orientalism has used logic, the way that it's constructed knowledge, the way that it determined what is truth and what is untruth. And according to Said's analysis, Orientalism has three interrelated uh, definitions. It's an academic field of inquiry, this we know. It's also a worldview, a system of representation and style of thought based upon an ontological and epistemological distinction made between the Orient and the Occident. And Orient and Occident, they're just fancy words. They're actually French words for East and West. So don't be uh, too frightened by those words. Orient, most of us have heard before as meaning the East and Occident just simply means the West. And Orientalism, according to Edward Said, is also a powerful tool of intellectual and colonial domination. Uh, we have to remember that the field of Orientalism really took off in the West with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. As um, so-called experts of the Orient came along with the army um, to study uh, Egyptians. And so Edward doubted the binary between the East and the West, as you saw in your reading, a distinction that did not exist until the Islamic expansion, which cut off half of Rome from itself. So if you think about this, we've been reading this whole time about the Islamic expansion, the Islamic conquests. You know, um, Rome, its territories, basically it encompassed or surrounded the Mediterranean Ocean from Spain to Italy to Greece to Romania to Anatolia, Palestine, Syria, uh, Jordan, Egypt, North Africa, all of it to Morocco. The Roman Empire ruled over all of that in uh, antiquity and um, they ha had created this culture of Hellenistic culture from you know Alexander the Great from Greece uh, conquered Egypt and Persia and was trying to push his way into uh, India and you know the you have this Greco-Roman heritage where all you know Rome inherited this Hellenistic heritage and Christianity spread throughout all of these lands. And it was one entity that is until the Islamic conquest. So of course we know that Persia and the West have always been fighting each other. So previously you could think, you know, Byzantine versus Sassanid, um, the Greco-Roman versus barbarians. You know, one thing that comes to mind is the famous movie uh, where Greece is fighting the Persians called 300. You know, this was how the world was constructed before. You had uh, the two world superpowers of Rome and Persia. And that was pretty much it. Carthage was long gone. Carthaginians were destroyed by Rome. Troy was long gone. And there's a film on that famous Hollywood film about Troy. 
And so really it was the Romans versus the Persians and the Romans, like I said, surrounded the Mediterranean. But then the long ignored Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula, all of a sudden after, with Abu Bakr burst out. And not only did they take parts of Anatolia, all of Syria and the Levant, you know, Sham, and uh, Egypt and North Africa to Cairo land, and eventually into Spain, um, they split the Roman world in half. And the northern half was all that was left of Christendom, as they called it was all that, that's how they, you know, identified themselves as Christendom, not really as Europeans at this point. And so that was really traumatic to the inheritors of the Greco-Roman world, which was the Byzantine Empire. And later on, um, you know, they, you had different, um, like this feudal medieval period, but they still held uh, highly to the idea of Rome and the Roman Empire. And they knew that now uh, half of it had been lost to these barbarous Arabs, as they thought. And it was a big blow to their self-identity and their self-conception. And ever since then, they had to conceive of themselves as Christendom against Islamdom, or Darul Islam versus Darul Harb in the Islamic way of thinking. So you have you have this binary between East and West and Edward Said says this is just, you know, a societal construction, social construction. This this is just a concept that people have simply made up. You know, geography doesn't really bear it out. Um, there's many things in common between the Islamic world and the Western world in some regards. You know, this is a pure, purely kind of a strange, perhaps sectarian division, Islamdom and Christendom, if you will. And because of all the similarities that exist between the two, um, Richard Bullitt, who is an Orientalist, um, he wrote a book um, about, you know, uh, a Christo Islamic civilization, considering them together as one civilization and he also has an autobiographical book on being an orientalist and what that was like and how he regretted some aspects of the orientalism that he may have perpetuated unknowingly and european literature for Said carried actualized and propelled orientalist notions forward and constantly reinforced them put differently Literature produced by Europeans made possible the domination of the people of the East because of the Orientalist discourse embedded within these texts. Literature here is understood as a kind of carrier and distributor of ideology or knowledge as power. So his book, Orientalism, proposes that much of the Western study of Islamic civilization was an exercise in political intellectualism a psychological exercise in the self-affirmation of European identity, not an objective exercise of intellectual inquiry and the academic study of Eastern cultures. Therefore, Orientalism was a method of practical and cultural discrimination that was applied to non-European societies and peoples in order to establish European imperial domination. In justification of empire, the Orientalist claims to know more essential and definitive knowledge about the Orient than do the actual Orientals. They claim to know more than the ulama about Islam. The hubris and arrogance behind that is shaitanic. And Edward Said says all of this as a Christian Arab. And it's ironic that Christian Arabs have often been some of our biggest allies in academia defending against Orientalism because they can see, they speak Arabic, they read stuff about Islam, they see Islam 
and its cultural practice and they say no these orientalists are saying a bunch of nonsense what they're writing is fiction it's not based in reality their whole entire epistemology is insufficient and really what orientalism is is propaganda it's ideology it is a system of thought is meant to change the way people think so that they can be dominated and i'm sorry to tell you but even some of our ulama have been influenced by orientalists some uh, average everyday muslims even though they may have never read an orientalist book are influenced by orientalism and influenced by western modernity because they heard the ideas from somebody from somebody from somebody and those ideas have started to permeate the way people think in the islamic world for instance the quraniyun the sect that they believe in just the quran and not the hadith they're a deviant sect got that idea from western orientalists who criticized hadith they did not exist in pre-modernity historically there was no such thing they are a new innovation a new group and that's why it's important to understand this history because it also helps us understand what is going on in the islamic world today should we adhere to this binary of darul harb versus darul islam anymore is that necessary now that the age of empires is over and we're in the age of nation states with treaties and agreements and the united nations and nato and these different things some ulama say no we don't need that anymore maybe what we could say is darul islam versus darul da'wa um, uh, Yusuf al qaradawi I believe says that uh, as well as others like uh, Tariq Ramadan you know how should we reconceptualize from a fiqh perspective our interactions with the West maybe Edward Said can lend us some data on how we can theorize from an indigenous Islamic perspective using our own usul al-din, our own usul al-fiqh, our own usul al-i'tiqad to deal with these types of things. So I think Edward Said is uh, extremely important to us as an ummah that, that we need to understand. Because not only will it understand why Orientalists come up with these lousy histories a lot of times or say things that are completely nonsensical, but it also helps us to understand who is the West. And especially for Western Muslims that live in the West, we need to understand our environment. We need to understand the waqa'ah, the realities in front of us. Especially if we're making fatwas and trying to be a mufti, we have to know fiqh al waqa'ah. And this is part of it. Next, we're going to talk about wa'il halaq. And Wa'il Halaq, he wrote a book restating Orientalism, a critique of modern knowledge. And by restating Orientalism, he means that restating Edward Said's book, Orientalism, because like I said, it was so paradigmatic in the Western Academy. And so he also is Palestinian Christian, born in 1955, and he graduated from the University of Haifa, and then he earned a master's degree and PhD from the University of Washington in uh, Islamic studies. And he currently teaches at Columbia University, just like Edward Said did. And so Professor Aziz Ran of Cornell University describes restating Orientalism as a brilliant interrogation of Edward Said's famous concept highlighting the extent which the issue of Orientalism is not simply one of problematic European authors, but instead goes to the heart of how the modern project itself constitutes subjects, knowledge, and power. It is essential reading and will be debated by scholars for years to come. 
Walter Mignolo, professor at Duke University, said of restating Orientalism that it is becoming increasingly evident amongst decolonial thinkers that colonial management, with or without colonies, with or without settlers, is a question of controlling and managing knowledge, and that power is diff power differential is implicit in agents, institutions, and languages of epistemic, that is epistemological, governance, governing the way people think. Wa'il Halaq brilliantly drives us through a meticulous reading of Edward Said's Orientalism to the awareness that domination is grounded on epistemic sovereignty, that liberation is unthinkable without epistemic freedom. It's all about epistemology, folks. It's all about epistemology. And I want I want theorization about epistemology to be in your final papers. In other words, Halak's main argument is that Edward Said's book does not go far enough. It was not critical enough. Edward Said was still arguing from modernity, which is itself a European colonizing paradigm that is utterly unable to understand religious phenomena. Uh, Wa'al Halaq, he actually calls it a psychoepistemic disorder. Psychological and epistemological. And it's a disorder. And it can't even understand pre-modern epistemologies. Halaq goes on throughout his book to criticize modernity i.e. the Enlightenment as a whole, demonstrating its harmful effects on humanity. So this is one quote uh, from his book, Secular Humanism, Anthropocentrism, Enlightenment Rationalism, and Liberalism, all of which rest on a mechanistic impulse and sovereign domination of the world are increasingly viewed as all too costly to maintain and as an excessive and unjustifiable, if not immoral, overreach. All this notwithstanding their benefits, undoubted benefits with equ equally undoubted disastrous side effects. And this brings to the foray the Cartesian cogito. Have you ever heard of the philosopher René Descartes? Well, he said this one famous phrase, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Or, I think, therefore I must conquer nature. I think I am, therefore I must dominate the world. That is really, in essence, the Western way of thinking. I am the enlightened one, and all of you non-Westerners are still in darkness and don't know how to properly think. And that is how many Orientalists, Orientalists treat us. They know about us more than we even know ourselves. And the arrogance and the hubris to that and the lack of understanding of our own indigenous scholarship I mean, they're just arrogant idiots. Ahl al Himar, right? And that's why it's important for us to study the response to Orientalism and understand how to deal with Orientalism, understand what it is. Because, like I said, these ideas are permeating global culture, international culture now. And it's up to us to push as a resistance against this new type of intellectual colonization. They won't colonize us directly with militaries anymore per se, although they do still do that. They want to colonize us intellectually first and foremost. And this brings us to Jonathan A.C. Brown. 
and I had you read a portion of his book, his book Hadith, Muhammad's Legacy in the Medieval and Modern World, because he has this excellent section in the book where he deals with Orientalism's response to Hadith. And he kind of cogently and clearly explains the Western historical method, and I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit. But just to give you some background, Jonathan Andrew Cleveland Brown graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts. That means he had like straight A's in history in 2000 from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He studied Arabic for a year at the Center for Arabic Study Abroad at the American University of Cairo. Um, for, seriously, though, guys, if you are struggling with Arabic and you really want to get good at Arabic, go to Egypt and study in their ma'ahed, their uh, like institutes. Not only are they cheaper than the rest of the Arab world, but boy, do Egyptians know Arabic really well. Don't don't let the awam, the commoners on the street who only speak Amaya dialect, uh, deter you. Their scholars of Arabic are some of the best. I'm telling you. And he completed his doctorate in Islamic thought at the University of Chicago in 2006, as I mentioned before. Um, just He's just a brilliant professor. He also is a Muslim convert, and he teaches now at Georgetown University, where he did his bachelor's. And in his book, Hadith, he crit critiques the modern Western historical critical method that was... Uh, employed first by Leopold von Drenke, as I mentioned um, in my, our first lecture in this class. And it was originally developed for biblical criticism, and then Orientalists applied that to Quran and Hadith. They still do. Angelica Neuwirth, who I had you read, is a person still entrenched in this Western historical critical method. Fred Donner, uh, Hugh Kennedy are highly entrenched in this uh, Western historical critical method. Um, most Orientalists, frankly, are. And it's a major historiographical difference between us Muslims and them. Secularism is itself an entirely Western and modern concept, which emerged from the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War, you can Google that and go look that up if you want to know more about it, is considered the most destructive and bloody wars in European history, which was completely fought over Christian sectarianism, i.e. Protestant versus Catholic. Um, some historians may say, oh, that was actually not the real purpose of the war. There was a lot of political and economic reasons, but the rhetoric, the rhetoric of it, the propaganda of it, the ideology of it, was under the guise of religious sectarianism and therefore this intergenerational trauma was passed down in the concept of the public square and secularism. They constructed this as a way to cope with all the damage that had been done in this war. How do we prevent this war from ever happening again? And their idea was secularism. However, since this Christian civilization only knew Christian thought, naturally, it could not even live up to their ideal of the secular, but rather it was a nominal safe space for Christians of different denominations to work together collectively and politically for the common good. And so Paul Kivel has this very famous book, um, it's called like under the Sh under the shade of the cross, Paul Kivel, under the shade of the cross. Um, he is a rabbi who wrote about Christian supremacy that dominates secular thought. How things that are labeled as secular actually have Christian um, theology behind those ideas. Um, for instance, good versus evil, how it's formulated in American law, even comes from Christian theology, as well as colonialism and all these different types of things, right? And Protestantism arose from the interaction between Christianity and Enlightenment ideas, or Renaissance ideas. So it's important that all these things were swirling together, 
you know, it's important to know that all these things are swirling together at once in the West. And, um, you know, what is secular doesn't really understand Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism or Shintoism or Taoism or any of the things that are not Christian or, uh, you know, Jewish, because Jews were in uh, Europe at that time. So the secularism has usually carved out a little bit more of a space for Jewish people. There's also this uh, book you could probably find on Amazon that's called uh, Christian Supremacy or Christian Privilege. There's another one, The End of White Christian America, that talk about um, how the secular is constructed in a way that privileges Christians and is at the detriment to all of other religions. So how is it actually secular? It doesn't live up to its own ideal. And so the Western historical critical method is nominally deemed a secular theory of history, but it's permeated with Christian the theological ideas, especially original sin, which is in contradistinction from the Islamic notion of the fitrah. So original sin uh, basically says that all humans are, are born inherently sinful. Or the Islamic notion of the fitrah is that we're all born inherently good and believing in tawhid. And so what this essentially means is that someone who is a narrator of an event, someone who, you know, is a rawi of a khabar, of a hadith, they are automatically deemed uh, a priori as unreliable. Unless, because they're just assumed to be a bad person. They're saying whatever they're saying for political motivation, for economic reasons, or whatever, what have you, but not just for the pure sake of truth. No, they are automatically deemed as lawyers, as fabricators unless it can be corroborated by others or corroborated by some type of other evidence. We see even this notion in the modern criminal legal system in the West, um, this idea that, you know, um, you are basically guilty until proven innocent. That's how the system actually works, even though they might nominally say innocent until proven guilty but we all know that that's not really the case is it that's not really how the world works is it so we have to see past the propaganda and so muslims we believe that people are automatically good they're by default going to be trustworthy or thiqa as they say in usul hadith unless we can prove that they are a known liar that they did certain types of fisk, of major sins, or that we know for sure they didn't meet the person they're narrating from, um, then we may begin to doubt that narrator. But our default position is that they're gonna be trustworthy. And so that's a major distinction between Islamic historiography and you might say Christian or Western or Christian dumb historiography, even though they nominally call it secular. And so that's just uh, a really important takeaway um, from Jonathan Brown, Professor Brown's book that I thought's really important for everyone to understand. You know, it's this, this distinction between husnudun, assuming good, about the people around you and su'avun or assuming bad about them automatically. The Islamic position is that we are always going to have husnavun. We're always going to give people the benefit of the doubt and think the best about them, even if we might not understand their actions. And that's how we approach the Khulafa Rashidun. You know, uh, that's when with the controversies swirling around Uthman and Ali and Muawiyah. We think the best about them. We want to give them benefit of the doubt. They were using their different ijtihads to do whatever they did. And they were doing it for virtuous reasons. 
and their intention, their niya, kulu, kulu a'malu bin niya, all their intentions were good intentions. That is husnul dhan. That's the Islamic perspective. But the Western perspective that has the secularized version of original sin automatically assumes that people, their human nature is essentially bad. They have su of one. They assume that they're evil. And it boils down to very deep philosophical questions. Are human beings inherently good or inherently evil? And that affects the way that we do and understand historical phenomena. How do we do history? What's our historiography? It's tied to deeper philosophical questions like how do you understand human nature? And that's what I want to highlight, that the way you do history goes very deep into your, your deep beliefs and your, your, your deep assumptions, maybe even unconscious assumptions. You know, Freud, why was Freud considered, uh, well, why was his thoughts considered as a revolution? They call it the Freudian revolution. Because he showed that human beings aren't always rational beings. The Enlightenment wanted to tell us that we were all rational beings. But no, we have this unconscious that's sometimes irrational that makes us do the opposite of what we say and believe. And I believe he stole that from the Sufis. He appropriated that from Islamic civilization, from what's known as tra traditional Islamic psychology, ilm nafs right? Purification of the heart, matarat al-qulub. Um, because these ideas already existed in Islam. Even the ancient Greeks talked about these things. It's nothing new. But Freud articulated it in a way that undermined what the Enlightenment was saying. And so all of these things, they matter to history and how we understand history. And that's my main point with bringing all of this up and having you read these readings. Now, Michel Foucault, he is considered the most influential philosopher to the Academy right now. Um, he's got many famous books. He's considered one of the leading uh, historians of the Western world. And by that, I mean not only coming from within the Western world, but also he is a historian of Western history. And so one of his most famous books is called Les Mots et les Choses, The Words and Things, which in English, they have an English translation, which is over here that is called the order of things. I don't know why they changed the name so dramatically. Um, but basically, he, he does a history of how Western sciences developed from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment to, you know, now and what we call post-modernity. Um, so it's relevant to the history of how Orientalism developed, how what's called uh, ethnology developed, which in America we call anthropology. And so he's considered the father of post-modernity. Um, his ideas have even been influential on Donald Trump, for instance, with alt facts. And, you know, Donald Trump, they say, is the conservative version of a post-modernist thinker. And Kant is the, considered the father of modernity, or the Enlightenment, what they called in German as Aufklärung. They called it Enlightenment in English, in the Anglo-Saxon world, but Aufklärung, which means explication, is what they called it in Germany, the German-speaking world. So Paul Michel Foucault was born on the 15th of October in uh, 1926 in the city of Poitiers, West Central France as the second of three children in a prosperous, socially conservative, upper middle class family, basically came from a rich, rich background. And he graduated from the elite Ecole Normale Supérieure with a bachelor's in philosophy in uh, 1948. And he basically got his master's as well in philosophy in 1949. And uh, his thesis 
was the constitution of a historical transcendental in Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Hegel was a very uh, famous enlightenment philosopher uh, from uh, Germany and he wrote this book phenomenology of spirit and uh, it's considered a, a classic in the western philosophical tradition and Foucault was also interested in psychology in fact he wrote many books on the history of uh, the field of psychology itself, the history of madness, and the history of uh, what they called, um, like, uh, uh, what were those called, like mental institutions. Um, and he highly criticized the way that modernity te uh, treats people who are mentally ill. And so he got a bachelor's in psychology and uh, a diploma in psychopathology um, and that was in 1952 so he was quite uh, busy in his studies he was also very concerned with punishment um, with the history of punishment and torture and imprisonment he's got one of the most um, paradigmatic books on the history of Western prisons um, and a lot of his work focused on the nexus between power and knowledge, building off of Friedrich Nietzsche. And he also agreed with Nietzsche's idea of subjectivity, that there is no real truth, that we all have our each individual truth. This is my truth and that is your truth. That comes from these philosophers. Uh, whereas Muslims and even Christians believe, no, there is an objective truth that exists beyond us beyond us and that's why one of the 99 names of god is al-haq the truth and so both of them you could say are the two great shaitans of modernity right they are wolves in sheep's clothing and in line with kant's binary between mature and immature foucault argues that we need to study all types of limits on our thinking um, our domains, which is like a big giant epistemology that governs other epistemologies. And he uses this term grids or in French, grille du intelligibilité or grid of uh, intelligibility, which uh, you might think of as kind of like a superstructure underpinning the way we think so that a domain you might say is Western modernity as a whole. Grill uh, du intelligibilité is going to be like um, Orientalism. It's one grid within the domain of modernity. And he said we need to study these limits in order to break free from these limits. And we're going to experiment upon ourselves with different ways of thinking of being and experiencing the world and for Foucault that meant that he wanted to have every kind of experience live the YOLO life he would do every type of drug have every type of sexual encounter he taught at a university in Tunisia where he molested Tunisian boys and he was an advocate for pedophilia and allowing children to give consent for sexual relations. So this was the type of man that, that Foucault was. And he also had this binary between savoir and connaissance. Both of those in English would translate as to knowledge, but in French they have this distinction where savoir was knowledge in a larger abstract sense like modernity, uh, uh, knowledge of a domain, whereas connaissance was particular details maybe stemming from a particular field of knowledge, so such as particular facts within psycholinguistics or particular facts within Orientalism, where Orientalism might be, as a whole, might be a savoir, and modernity would be even a larger savoir, right? So this is kind of in kind of the, the way of thinking that uh, Michel Foucault employed and you know some of that when you subsume it under the don't if you subsume Foucault's thought under the domain 
of Islamic thought, some of these ideas actually are useful as tools. So like his uh, analysis of epistemology. But that's the thing. For Foucault, there's no real haq, there's no real truth, which is, we know, as Muslims, false. We have our aqidah, we have our arguments from kalam, if you believe in kalam. And we have the Qur'an and sunnah. The Qur'an is a mu'ajaza. It is a miracle, linguistic miracle. They use the term i'jaz al-Qur'an. We know of the Qur'an's miraculous nature. And we believe in an objective truth. But that, in a nutshell, is what Michel Foucault is talking about. So Kant and Michel Foucault, in a sense, are the domain of modernity. They are the savoir of modernity, and Orientalism stems out from them both. It is a connaissance of Kant and Foucault. So to understand what is Orientalism is also to understand what is Enlightenment. And so these are some books for further reading. Uh, you could maybe say that they're honorable mentions, but they didn't quite make the cut. Um, you know, due to the scope of this class only being 12 sessions, unfortunately, I will only be able to mention these books briefly. But I would love to talk forever and ever and ever with you guys about these books. Um, but alas, I will give you a brief um, overview. So here is this book by Leila Gandhi, Post-Colonial Theory, A Critical Introduction. And that talks about refuting Orientalism and just post-colonial, like re refuting colonial thought uh, more broadly. Post-colonial thought or theory is uh, basically theorization from non-Western epistemologies, criticizing Western dominance and refuting their ridiculous ideas about the Orient or non-Western world. So that's an uh, important book if you're interested in that type of thing. Over here from Hamid Dabashi, who works in the comparative literature department at uh, Columbia and was a colleague of Edward Said. He's got this book, Post-Orientalism, Knowledge and Power in a Time of Terror, where he also kind of takes Edward Said's book, Orientalism, to a different level. And he focuses on German Orientalism, which Edward Said didn't really get a chance to do. He also has this book down here, Can Non-Europeans Think? Of course they can. He himself is Persian, and he argues against um, Western hegemony of philosophy. He says, well, of course, non-Western people can think, and we have to acknowledge that. And whenever you see philosophy listed at a university, it's meaning old white guys. Really, uh, it should be philosophies from all of the world. And we shouldn't just call it African philosophy or Islamic philosophy or Chinese philosophy. No, all of it is philosophy and it all should be recognized as such. Over here, we have Thomas Bauer. This was recently uh, translated to English from German. In German, I think it was uh, Der Kultur uh, der Ambiguität or something like that. Um, and he also is saying, like Wa'al Halaq, that modernity is fully insufficient to understand um, religious phenomena. Uh, modernity by its nature cannot tolerate ambiguity, where Islam has always tolerated ambiguity to a very high extent. Therefore, Orientalism cannot understand Islam. Over here we have Wa al Halaq again. He's got this fa famous book, The Impossible State. It's also been translated into Arabic as Ad Dawla al Mustahila. And it's basically about how the modern nation state, which is a product of the Enlightenment, is completely incompatible with Sharia. There's no such thing as having a nation state that has Sharia, because by their very uh, ideological foundations, they are opposites. Modernity is opposite from Sharia. And over here, we have Talal Assad. Talal Assad, if you don't know, is the son of Muhammad Assad, the famous Quran translator and uh, 
you know, he wrote the book A uh, uh, Road to Mecca, Tariq ila Mecca. Um, there's a great documentary about him I can recommend if you're interested about Muhammad Assad. Who, who he was a Jewish convert to Islam from Austria. He married a Saudi woman, and Talal Assad is the product of that marriage. And he went on to become a very famous anthropologist. And he does anthropology of the Islamic world as well as anthropology of what secularism is or how it form, form, formed in the Western world, which this is the main topic of this book, Formations of the Secular Christianity, Islam, Modernity. He talks about how modernity impacted Egypt and stripped away Sharia and replaced it with Western law and those types of things. So this is a really important book to understand what secular means and understand post-colonial thought. He also has this newer book that came out when I was doing my master's degree called Secular Translations, Nation State, Modern Self, and Calculative Reason, where he brings it more to the American context and he, you know, analyzes things like, oh, you know, America was founded in the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is obviously a bunch of nonsense. Um, so is secular just meant to exclude Islam then? Or what is secular? And then last but certainly not least is William Chittick's book that I've mentioned multiple times throughout this course, Science of the Cosmos, Science of the Soul, The Pertinence of Islamic Cosmology in the Modern World. And basically in that book, he talks about how Western modernity, the Enlightenment, is a philosophy of takthir or uh, dividing things and compartmentalizing things into small, you know, very precise fields of knowledge. Um, you know, you have modernity as a main domain of thought, but then Orientalism as a branch of that, which is a further compartmentalization. You have uh, within that Orientalists who specialize in Sharia, who specialize in Sufism, who specialize in Islamic theology, who specialize in, you know, X, Y, Z, and they really don't talk to each other all that much unless they're in that same small subfield. That is an example of takthir. And William Chittick says, no, the Islamic ethos has always been tawhid, to make things as one, to make as wahid hence Tawheed, and that um, different ways of thinking that might have been uh, disparate from one another in Islamic civilization always get brought together, which is a synthesization of various types of knowledge. You know, um, philosophy gets put in with usul fiqh, um, tafsir gets influenced by Israeliyat and Usul Hadith gets thrown into Tafsir and all these things, all types of knowledges get synthesized together into one coherent holistic whole. That is Tawheed. That's what Islamic civilization has always been about. And that's why, um, you know, some of the late like Ottoman thinkers had highly sophisticated systems of thought because they were synthesizing everything that came before all of the intellectual productions from Islamic civilization that came before. And some of these very uh, influential figures is like Ibn Jawzi, Ibn Ghazali, Imam Ghazali, Ibn Jawzi, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Arabi, you know, and the list could go on and on um, of these types of paradigmatic figures that synthesized all different kinds of information into one holistic whole, which is Tawheed. It's bringing God together, but it's bringing all forms of knowledge together because where does all knowledge come from? Al Alim al Hakim al Khabir, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, I will conclude this lecture. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. And tawfiq on your final papers.